we had. Okay, probably not so. Can you see the slide? Yes, sir. Okay, good. Okay. So we are talking about pipelining and we talked about data dependency at length. We also understood the difference between dependency and hazard. I repeatedly told you that data de dependency is a property of a program and uh, as a processor designer, you can't do anything about it. If it is there, it is there. You only have to see whether the dependency will be converted into a hazard or not. If it gets converted into hazard, then you know you have to take appropriate steps. Uh, we also discussed what the appropriate steps are. Uh, we talked about that appropriate steps could be uh, designing forwarding path, or in some cases where you know there is a problem, we can have. Uh, 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 a bubble, I mean, in the worst possible case. And we also discussed in which cases forwarding path would help, how many forwarding paths would require. And also we discussed about how many, uh, uh, the combination of uh, instructions are there, you know, which for which there is no cure, but to have a bubble. So, Moving on, I showed you that you know this is the data dependency. Now I and J could be anywhere. And then I showed you for a five stage pipeline, how long would this dependency cause and hazard? So suppose if these two instructions write one after the other, they will cause dependency. But what if there is another instruction between them? Then we saw that this would still cause a hazard unless you know we have a forwarding path from memory. What if you know there are two instructions between these? Well, then you know, I mean, this would still dependency would still cause a hazard unless there is a read in the second half, right in the first half kind of uh, register file. And then you know, if there are three instructions between them, between this and this I and J, then you know, probably you don't require any forwarding path or any uh, uh, kind of register tricks. Now, if nothing is mentioned, then you know you can assume that forwarding paths are there and it is full forwarding paths are there. So whatever number of forwarding paths are required, you know, they are there. And also the register file is such that you know the writing is done in the first half of the cycle and reading is done in the second half of the cycle. Uh, we saw that there is uh, the dependency or you know the chance of a dependency getting converted into a hazard is very much dependent on implementation so two instructions which would cause a problem in a five stage pipeline it will not cause a hazard problem in a two stage pipeline and you know i have showed you uh, with an example that why it would not cause a problem I also gave you a homework problem that what if there is a seven stage pipeline, then how many forwarding paths we would require? And then, you know, you are supposed to think about it and, you know, do it as part of the homework. So here you can see that if you want to be sure and if you want to show it using this, then, you know, you can, you should write a table like this. And then, you know, you can very quickly say that, you know, because uh, data or uh, register values are required in decode stage, then it will be prepared and, you know, at what point it will be required. So, like, you know, you can see between third and fourth stage, you want your output coming 
uh, from the memory stage and you know feedback into the input of ALU. So that's where you know you require a forwarding path. Here you do not require any forwarding path because you know you have made a new uh, type of arrangement where this writing is done in the first half of the cycle. So that means the value of R1 would be written in the first half of the cycle. And you know it will be read uh, in the second half of the cycle. So that is uh, what we are uh, going to do. And then you know you can see that between fifth instruction and first instruction, even though there is dependency, it is not going to cause any hazard, even if there is no forwarding path or even if there is no uh, smart way of writing first and reading second. Okay. Does anyone have any question up to this point? I I think I'm recording this. Uh, okay, the recording is already on. Someone had asked in the chat window. Okay, so uh, I hope everything is clear up to this point. And you know, then you know, someone uh, asked a question that you know, how do you decide that you know, you, should you read the value of R1 from register file or from the feedback path, which is coming from output of ALU, or that means execute cycle or output of memory stage? How, which one should you read? And that is not part of this course. I mean, that you know, you have to design a clever uh, control circuit, which would, uh, which will have to make a choice which one to read. Uh, if this is a three stage, then you know again you have to decide whether it is going to cause. Do you require any forwarding path or not? Uh, we also talked about war hazard and wow hazard. Uh, war hazard is known as anti-dependence. Raw hazard is also known as true dependence. War is exactly opposite of it. That you know you have to. If these two instructions, this is the program order. In I instruction number I, you are reading the value of register R1 first, and the second instruction is writing it. Then you are making sure that uh, you follow up in this order. Uh, in inline pipelining, if we do not mess with the order of instruction, then you know we will not have any war hazard in simple inline pipelining. That means whatever pipelining, which is like serial pipeline that you know we have seen till now, studied till now. War hazard will not be that unless you try to mess with the program order. I told you that program order is sort of a sacred thing for computer scientists. But you know, if you are kind of a brave and you know if you're very careful, then I told you that you know you can change the program order provided you make sure that by changing the program order, you are not incurring any raw war or wow hazard. If you are not doing that, then you know you can change program order. But the second question you may ask is, why do you want to change the program order? Well, the reason I told you earlier is exactly for this kind of instruction that there is load which is followed by dependent arithmetic instruction, and for that there is no forwarding path which is going to help you because you can't come back in time. So in that case, we have to have a bubble. So the solution to avoid this bubble is, can you put <clears throat> an instruction between this load instruction and immediately follow uh, by uh, dependent arithmetic instruction? If you can put an instruction somewhere in between them, then by the time that instruction is executed, your uh, this instruction you know will not have any problem, and you know it can actually read from the register file. So then, you know, this problem, you will not have to have any bubble and, you know, you can uh, move forward. So that is the reason why you would be tempted to change the program order. We still have not studied the control hazard, which we are just going to study in this lecture, that in control hazard also, you are going to have a problem. And, you know, in that case, you would like to change the program order. So while having said that, you know, Program order is 
very much required and you know people don't want or don't like to mess with the program order <clears throat> but internally if you make sure that it is not going to cause any problem then you know you check for war hazard you check for wow hazard you check for row hazard and if it is not going to create any problem you can change program order so as to avoid bubbles okay and then then you know there is wow hazard which is known as output dependent so here i is supposed to write into register r1 first and then instruction j is to write into r1 if you change this uh, then you know it is going to cause a problem but once again if you don't change the program order it is not going to cause you any problem in our inline kind of pipelining but then you know again as i said sometimes you want to change the program order just to avoid a bubble so uh, having discussed all raw war and wow hazard a problem like this can be given to you and you know you would be asked that identify all the raw war and wow hazard dependencies remember the word i have asked you to identify the dependencies so then you know i don't have to tell you how many stages are there or because you know dependency is not dependent on your implementation your processor can be two stage or 100 stage but dependencies are dependencies if i want to ask you a question which dependency is going to cause a hazard then you know in that particular case you will have to actually see that okay it's a five stage pipeline so then you know probably this and this uh, can cause a problem uh, or this and this can cause a problem then if i ask you in five stage pipeline and suppose if i want to change this put this equation i mean uh, instruction number 4 and put it on top of instruction number 0 how many checks do i have to make forget whether that is r2 or r6 or something you know this is just an algorithm i'm asking you to develop i'm asking you to write let's say a c program that you know i want to take instruction number 4 put it on top of instruction number 0 how many instructions do i need to how many registers do i need to check so for this one if i want to put it on top of this and first if i want to check for raw hazard then you know i want need to take these two source operands that is this one and this one and then i need to check it with the uh, destination operand of instruction number 3 destination operand of instruction number 2 destination operand of instruction number 1 and destination operand of instruction number 0 if there is any uh, place you know if you find uh, 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 what should i say if there is any uh, dependence then you know i can't put it on top of here if there is no dependence then i can put it on top of here then you know if i want to checking for raw is not the only thing you also have to check for war hazard so for war hazard you will do exactly opposite you will match the destination register of instruction number 4 with the source of friends of these instructions before if it is causing if there is any dependency then you know you can't put it on top of this otherwise it will cause a war hazard and for checking for wow hazard i will check the source of friend sorry uh, the destination of friend of instruction number 4 with the destination of friend of instruction 3 2 1 and 0 if it is causing a wow dependency then you know i can't put it on top of this because then you know it is going to cause about has so these are the total number of checks that you will have to make so after the mid term i will ask you to write a c program for which for any given number of instructions will check for raw war and wow hazard and you know would say that you know instruction number x can it go on top of instruction number y okay does anyone have any question up to this point Yes, sir. Yes. Yes, sir. Go to the twentieth slide. Yeah. So in in this slide, this we want to write. The this C is the twentieth slide. Slide. Yes. So if we want to write the C program, so the function would be given. 
total number of instructions and for each instruction the source of run and the destination of run and uh, see the, it should instructions be sent... will be given in certain format right ah yes so, I mean, you know that you know the format is going to be like this or it is going to be like this so then you know you have to make write a smart program that you know for all algebraic instructions are usually has one destination and two source operands or load store type of uh, like you know uh, there is one destination register for load and then you know other in, uh, register may be given may be containing the address of the memory location so those things you know you need to see and then you know you have to write an appropriate program okay okay yeah okay so now the second question is you have seen here that you know this is going to you have to have put a bubble over here between 0 and 1 because no forwarding path is going to alleviate the problem which will be caused between 0 and 1 so this is how it is going to look like that you know in cycle k this program will be shoved in but in cycle k plus 1 you will have to throw a bubble otherwise you know these two would bump into each other so you can rearrange the program when you say you so either you or the compiler and would try to find out an instruction if which if you put it over here is not going to cause problem to any other instructions behind it so you need to put i'm sorry any instruction above it you don't care for instructions below it you only care for instructions above it so then you know you can if you arrange it like this you are going to save one cycle and if this were to be put in a loop and if this loop were to be going to be executed 1000 times then here if in the original program you will be wasting 1000 cycles whereas in the rearrange program you will not be wasting any cycle right but you know here you have to be very very careful that you know you are not causing any hazard in shifting this instructions so let me ask you a question uh so let me ask you a question like this see i have a five stage pipeline which has got patch decode execute memory and write back okay and this is going to cause me a problem if i have load followed by any arithmetic or logical instruction let's say subtract and this is a, this is a dependent instruction on this right so this kind of pair dependent pair is definitely going to cause a problem here if this one is immediately following this load instruction so now my designer came to me and said okay let's design a new pipeline i will do fetch i will do decode i will do memory i will do execute and then i will do write back now if you tell me that you know to access memory you do require alu because you know you have to do complicated address calculation because like you know you must have seen in load that you know for calculating the effective address you know you may have to shift it by uh, two bits or add something into it so my designers are telling me okay we are going to put some little bit of circuitry over here you know that is going to do all the address calculation it may not do very complicated operation but you know it is going to do every problem over here so in that particular case my designers told me that you know this problem would be solved and you know so i want you to do two things 
first of all, think for yourself that you know a new design where I would first patch, decode a new and improved memory stage, which has got also address calculation type of uh, circuitry. Then I have got execute and then write back. So that means the value of load would be calculated right over here. And then it will come to execute state. So, you know, the problem which we had between the load and uh, immediately following a dependent arithmetic instruction was that, you know, the value of the register would not be available when this one is in decode stage. So that problem, I think you can see for yourself that, you know, it would be solved. So, first of all, I would like you to tell me whether that is a good design for me to solve at least this problem. Is it solving it or not? This was an exam question maybe two years ago. What do you think? It will solve this problem. I'm sorry? But it will solve this problem, but it will create errors for different type of arithmetic dependence. Okay. Sir, it will solve only these, these types. Say that again, please. Uh, this, uh, this design will solve only this LDR type problem. And there is LDR and then followed by that arithmetic operation. Okay. So I want those people to answer who have not read previous year's notes or everything that, you know, what problem it would create. See, this kind of problems, I would like you to think for the first time and then, uh, then give you an answer. It's like, you know, giving uh, someone to solve a puzzle, you can find out intelligence of a person. Uh, if the for, if the problem is shown to them for the first time that they independently come up with the answer, you know, that's a great thing. If you have seen how that puzzle is solved, you know, someone has told you the answer, then the puzzle is the most easy thing. So can someone tell me you have not seen this problem before? Sir, but uh, if load instruction is there, then it will be wasting one cycle in execution state because it is not doing anything. That and uh, everything sure. is but then you know that problem would be uh, for like you know all add subtract all arithmetic instruction will be wasting this cycle right you know what are they going to do in memory so that problem was was there anyway that all the add subtract and other instructions were going to waste this cycle i mean of course they will be getting and getting in and getting out So I want you to think that what problem this kind of uh, arrangement would create, that is number one, and how can you solve it? So first you have to find out a pair of instructions which could cause a hazard even with full forwarding paths. Okay. So this I'm giving you as a thinking problem. Uh, I mean, it's very easy if you start thinking about it. So you can figure out this problem for yourself. If you don't know the answer to this, you can ask me the answer after your midterm. Okay, now we've come to the second type of hazard. The first, pro I mean, uh, class of hazard we were studying up to this point was the data hazard. And data hazard is something, you know, which is like, you know, now 
very easily understood by you guys because you know you are writing software programs and till now uh, you never uh, thought about it that you know why it is going to cause why it is not causing a problem well it was not causing a problem because you know hardware was helping you and if the hardware was not able to help you then your compiler would take care of the problem you know it could do so by shifting so that's why you know you guys were not worried about you know what order you write instruction you know you would write instruction and your processor would take those instruction as a golden design a uh, processor would not care if your logic is wrong if your logic is wrong then it's your problem it's not processor's problem so processor would faithfully give you answer based on the logic that you have designed but keeping your logic intact it would try to do something you know which is uh something you know which is slightly uh interesting so now you know we are coming with a structural hazard so structural hazard is that you know when two uh, pipeline stages are trying to access the same set of hardware so now we have already taken care of such problems so the problems which we can visualize and you know we have already taken care of them so in a five stage pipeline See, I keep on giving you example of a five-stage pipeline, but you know, in the world, there is not just five-stage pipeline processors possible. You know, there are many number of stages, but you know, this is the example is the most simple one. So this is patch, decode, execute, memory, and write back. Can someone tell me which stages accesses memory? Patch, memory, and write back. Say that again, please. Patch, memory, and write back. Okay, so one is memory and second one is write back. That is not correct. Write back accesses register file. And you know, you, I mean, you may argue that registers also is a sort of memory, but you know, we don't call it memory, we call it register. Uh, memory is something which is other than registers so starting from cache onwards patch and memory okay so fetch stage and memory stage they access memory fetch stage fetch i mean uh, requires to check memory to bring in instructions right because you know yours is a stored program type of architecture you would type out your program and then you know feed it to your compiler and compiler would compile it and put it in some memory location so fetch uh, of course we'll have to look at the value of the program counter and based on whatever the value of the program counter it will go to that particular memory location and then you know it would fetch a particular um, stuff ones and zeros which is over there uh, and then feed it to uh, decode stage. I says, you know, it will bring in ones and zeros because patch stage doesn't know what it is. Right? You know, for patch stage, it could be anything. So all your uh, instructions will be fetched by this particular stage. Whereas this memory stage will access data. So this will access data and this will access instruction. Now, you know, if you are trying to design a cheap memory or a cheap processor you know you want to just have one memory you know which will have just one memory and you know you say i don't want to have separate instruction memory and separate data memory i just want to have just one big map so what would happen is that you know this memory would be once the so pipeline is filled continuously fat stage and memory stage would want to access it of course, patch stage, how many times, suppose if your program is 100 lines long, 
How many times fat state will have to access memory? Sir, 100 times the number of instructions. Okay, one answer is 100. Do you agree with it? Okay, so let us assume that answer is correct that batch stage will have to access memory 100 times. How many times for the same program, uh, the memory stage, that is the fourth stage, will have to access data memory? Sir, it will depend on the program. Uh, it will it will have to access the access the number of times load instructions is ex, ex, accessing memory. Load yeah, instructions. Can you still give a slightly clearer and sharp answer? It's a one line answer. Sir, the number of lines is load and store instructions are there. Mm, not very clear. Number of load and store instructions in the program. Yes, the number of load and store instructions. So this. Uh, memory data memory will be accessed dependent on how many loads and store instructions are there in a program. So if you have got a hundred line programs, and out of which thirty six instructions are load stored, so data memory would be accessed thirty six times, and instruction memory would be accessed hundred times, right? Because instruction memory naturally each and every instruction will have to be fetched, whether it is uh, arithmetic instruction or if it is load store instruction. Whereas the data would be accessed dependent on whether it's a load store instruction, right? You know, other instructions don't access data memory. So if you unfortunately, if you have just one memory, then you know at least 36 times. I mean, I'm assuming in a hundred line program there are 36 load store instructions. Then you know 36 times, either you will have to stall this instruction fetch or the data memory fetch. Why? Because they would both of them would try to access it at the same time. So that is known as a structural hazard. Uh, thankfully, even for the smallest processor, now we are saying that you know let us make a separate instruction memory and separate data memory, at least for the first level. Then we can have a combined, but at least for the first level of cache, let's have separate instruction memory and separate data memory so that none of them uh, are uh, going to be, uh, you know, stepping upon each other's toes. So that's how we have avoided structural hazard. The second thing was that which stages would like to access register file out of these five stages? Decode and write back. Memory and write back. No, it is decode and write back. Right? Because decode stage would like to read the source operands. And in write back, the destination registers will have to be written back. So these two, if there are arithmetic instructions, then you know these two would be bothering each other because you know write back wants to write and you know decode wants to read. So that problem, as I mentioned uh, several times earlier, that you know we have uh, solved that structural hazard problem by making sure that writing is done in the first half of the cycle and reading is done in the second half of the cycle. So there are two structural hazards possible in this simple inline processor. In fact, there will be many more structural hazard if you talk about superscalar process uh, processor and if you talk about multi-core processor, then there would be several more uh, structural hazards which would be coming in. But for your simple five-stage pipeline, uh, just your uh, fetch and memory stage problem of accessing memory simultaneously, that has been solved by giving them separate memories each, one for instruction and one for data. And accessing register file structural hazard has been uh, eliminated by making sure that writing is done in the first half and reading is done in the second half. So for our purpose, 
uh, we have solved the structural hazard problem completely in a uh, five stage inline problem. But you know, if it were uh, a super scalar processor with multiple execution units in parallel, or there are multiple processors working in tandem, like in multi core processor, which you have in your laptop or in your mobile phone, then you know there are many more structural hazards could come. And that you know we will see when we come up to that point. So does anyone have any question in the structural hazard? Or is it clear? Okay. Apparently, this problem is clear of structural hazard. Now we are coming down to a final problem, which is control hazard. See now, control hazard is the biggest performance degradation causing a hazard that you know you may have uh, in your program at any point. Now you know you are saying that you know in control hazard, the rule of the computer science is that you know if you have written a loop. Then you know instruction control dependent on a branch cannot be moved before the branch so that its execution is no longer controlled by the branch. I mean, this you would agree. And then instruction is not control dependent on a branch, cannot be moved after the branch so that execution is controlled by the branch. So let us uh, see it by an example. So let us say I have written this five line program, it's instruction number one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and nine. So it's a nine line program. And I have got a loop. And this is a kind of a conditional statement, number five. It checks the condition. If the condition is not met of terminating the loop, it will go back to instruction number one. Otherwise, you know, when the condition is met, it will come down to six, seven, eight, nine, and then terminate. So this is a very simple program. Now, what this uh, control uh, hazard will be created, if I try to take instruction number two or three, or four out of this loop and put it over here. Now, execution of two and three and four is definitely dependent on the outcome of instruction number five. If I put it outside the loop, then you know you may have a problem that you know, okay, I mean this is going to cause a problem because you know this thing now is not controlled by uh, this loop termination condition. Conversely, if I try to take instruction number six, seven, eight, and nine and try to put it inside this, then also I have a problem. Of course, you may ask, you know, why would you want to do that? Well, as I told you earlier, you know, for raw hazard uh, removal, I may want to put some instruction between one and two. Suppose if one is a load instruction and two is a uh, dependent. Uh, add instruction, then you know I may want to put some instruction which is not causing, which is not going to cause a raw hazard. So I may be tempted to lift instruction number six, seven, eight, and put it over here, which according to basic computer science law is a no-no, that you know you can't do that because it will create a control hazard. But just as I said that you know you should not cross the road other than you know where the zebra lines are there you know in india uh, you can cross it anywhere but i'm talking about some western country or some countries like japan where the rule of law is prevalent so people cross only from traffic uh, islands where the zebra lines are drawn so what is the algorithm of crossing the road in an indian way well you can cross it the road any way you like you know if you look left and right on both sides and start running. So that means now the onus of your life is on yourself. Similarly, you can take an instruction from here and put it over here if you make sure it is not going to cause any problem. Now, 
first of all, you may ask, OK, tell me the need for it. OK, I will tell you the need for it. So this is a five stage pipeline. This is batch, this is decode, execute, memory and write back. Now, say instruction number one, you know, it has gone through and it has come up to here. Instruction number two is here, instruction number three is here, four is here, and five is here. In the next cycle, five will move here in decode, then four will move here, three will move here, two will come here, and then one is already finished execution. So, you know, it is out. Five is here. Now the question is, suppose this termination condition is not met. You don't know, your program counter doesn't know what instruction would should it bring in, because you know, the outcome of of this execution of this conditional statement, you know, conditional statement is either like add or subtract, some kind of thing. So you require some kind of execution, ALU. So whether you want to take a branch or not take a branch, only you will know at the output of execute stage. Now, till the file does not reach execute stage and is executed, till then you don't know whether to take a branch or not take a branch. So your program counter would say, OK, I know only one thing unless I'm told otherwise I need to bring in the. Next uh, instruction in line so that you know it will bring in instruction number six. Now, after another cycle, your three will move here Two would have finished execution. Four will move here, five will come here, six will come here and of course. Because you know, still your program counter has not received any indication. So I will say, okay, I will bring in instruction number seven. Now, in the next cycle, when this file has finished execution, immediately a message will go to program counter that you know, in program counter, there are two inputs PC gets PC plus four. That is your normal thing, and this four are bytes. Or, you know, you can say PC gets PC plus one word. So, I mean, let us talk about bytes. So, I mean, this is the normal thing. Or it will go as from the output of execute stage that, you know, now you have to jump to this particular thing. So, this particular address will be given, and PC will take that value, and it will not get PC, uh, takes PC plus four. But till then, you have brought in instruction number six and instruction number seven. Now you are saying, oh, you are not supposed to leave the loop. You are supposed to go back to one. So now what will happen? You will have to flush the pipelines. That means remove this, remove this, and in the next cycle, bring in one. So then, you know, the next cycle, what would happen? Four will be here. Five will be here. Then, you know, then there will be two bubbles. Because you know you had to throw away whatever was there, and now cost will come. So now you see the problem. Every loop, you are wasting two cycles because you did not know whether your program counter didn't know whether you will have to take the conditional uh, branch or you don't have to take that branch. Now imagine if this is a thousand times you have to take the loop, you will be wasting two thousand cycles. And you know, loop is the, one of the most common thing written in your program. I mean, without a loop, you cannot write a you know reasonably good program. And you know, you have got multiple number of loops, and some loops are taken hundred times, some loops are taken thousand times. And here, every time you'll be wasting two cycles. So for a thousand cycle loop, you'll be wasting two thousand cycles. So that is something you say, okay, this is a no-no. I don't want to waste two cycles every time. So what do you do? So you say, if it is possible, right now, and I don't know what is instruction number, what is instruction number two, what is instruction number three, what is instruction number four. So now my compiler starts thinking, or I can start thinking if I don't have a 
help of a smart compiler. I may ask myself, suppose instruction number two and three are not going to cause any problem. There will not be any raw bar or wow hazard. If I write my program like this, Okay, so let us see what this is doing. Now in this particular thing, instruction number one is here, instruction number four is here, and instruction number five is here. At that time, two and three have already come over here. After this five, you are going to bring in instruction number two, and then you know it is going to be instruction number three. So your with this kind of program structure, your pipeline may look like this. So this is one, this is four, this is five, this is two, this is three. Now, the fun begins here. Even if your output of this five, that means the solution of this conditional statement in five, if it says, take a branch or not take a branch, you are not worried because two and three which are here are supposed to be executed anyway, right? Because, you know, they were supposed to be part of the loop. So you may say, I don't mind, you know, now I've got an early warning. I will let two exec get go to execution, three go to decode, but now I have got enough time. Should I bring in instruction number one? Or should I bring in instruction number six? You see the clever uh, the cleverness which is done by a compiler or by you. You have taken these two instructions sort of out of the loop, but because of the, the structure of the pipeline, you are making sure that after five, you are allowing two to execute and you are allowing three to execute. You are not throwing them away because those results are needed. Yes, suppose if you are storing something in two and three, and then you know you are shifting them down, then you know you will have to change some of the stack pointers. You may have to change some of the reference points. You may have to change some of the, uh, I don't know, uh, you may be adding some number and then uh, storing it. So four might be say store instruction and two and three might be say you are reducing or increasing the count and now they are putting you are putting it outside it then you know you have to make changes in the program and that your compiler will do it for you or you know you will have to do it yourself but you know if you take care of those things then your output of, see as a user if you are only writing c program and say i just want a correct result i don't care in what order my instructions are done you know i leave that thing to the processor designer and they will, and, and compiler designer, and operating system designer, they will design it in such a way that, you know, I will get my output. But, you know, as a normal programmer, I don't care how you do it, as long as I get the correct answer, right? When you write a C program and you get the correct answer, you don't say that, you know, how it was executed. Was it executed line by line or exactly in the way which I intended? Or, or compiler played its part and, you know, shifted around my instructions of course, taking care that it is not going to create any hazard and give me the wrong answer. If that is done, then you know, this is going to be really good. And these are the reasons why, you know, you need to be careful about data hazard and uh, control hazard. Uh, in data hazard, you have to be worried about raw, war, and wow, because this is very important. To put it in your instruction to make it better. This would also explain the question I asked you earlier. And the question I asked you earlier was that, you know, if I break down my five stage pipeline into 10 stages, then my work will be done twice as fast. When I say work will be done, means my throughput will be twice as much. So why not divide this up into 100 uh, stages? or thousand stages. So now you can see the problem here. Here in a five stage pipeline, you know, I was losing only two cycles, but you know, suppose if I have a hundred stage pipeline 
and my execute stage was number 60. Right? So that means I'll be, unless you know this instruction is resolved, the conditional statement, which is going to be resolved in the 60th stage, I will have 59 instructions over here, which would be done in program order. And you know, even if you, I'm allowing you to do this, it is not always easy to so coolly do things like this. You know, sometimes, you know, you just have to take a penalty of two cycles if you can't find an instruction which you can bring in here without causing any problem or take it out of here without causing any problem. So this is the best case scenario. Doesn't mean it will happen every time because every time your compiler will not be able to find an instruction which is totally independent. It is not going to cause any war, war wow, or uh, raw hazard or going to cause a structural hazard. So that is what I've shown you is the best case scenario. It doesn't happen most of the time, you know, you have to throw in bubbles. So imagine if a hundred stage pipeline and you have to take 59 bubbles. So I mean, it's a huge amount of loss that you're incurring. So that's why pipeline stages are like limited to at most the biggest pipeline I've seen is like 20 stage, 22 stage. Beyond that, people don't go. And this is one of the main reasons because of this control hazard of the branch statements that, you know, if your branch statement is resolved later, it's like, you know, in five stage pipeline, it is resolved in the third stage. In seven stage pipeline, it may be resolved in the fourth stage or fifth stage. In hundred uh, stage pipeline, it might be resolved in the 60th stage and, you know, so on and so forth. So that is one of the reason why things are not done later uh, or, you know, you don't want to increase the number of pipeline stages because, you know, a compiler, you know, if you ask to find out 59 instructions and put it outside the loop, I, I don't think it can do it because your loop itself may not be that long. So then, you know, you have to take care of other things, which is known as branch prediction, which we are going to study as a next topic. But, you know, up to this point, this is all that you have. And this is what control hazard means. And in control hazard, you know, you are paying a big penalty. Uh, you are losing cycles uh, because you don't know the outcome of the branch. And because of that, you are losing cycles. And, you know, how much penalty you will pay is dependent on how many pipeline stages are there. And, you know, in five stage pipeline, you will lose two. In three stage pipeline, you will lose one uh, cycle. In seven stage pipeline, you may lose four cycles, so on and so forth. Is this clear up to this point? And sir, this hazard will occur uh, also when, the, uh, means whenever there is a branch instruction, right? Not only yes. in the... Every time there's a, see, hazard will not be created if you don't want to do something like this. If you are ready to accept two cycles penalty every time, there is no hazard. The hazard is when you try to do something clever like this, or your compiler tries to do something clever like this. Every and also I told you that every time it may not be possible to do something like this because you know this may create a lot of hazards. And you know, if it's a long program, big program, then you know. So this is the like what I showed you was the best case scenario for a five stage pipeline that you know you're not losing any cycle. But every time it may not happen, and you may end up taking a uh, penalty. Uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. And sir, my question was that every time there is a branch instruction, we may be losing uh, these. We may be losing two cycles in case of five stage pipeline, right? Not not yes. only in loops, right? Sir? I mean, I'm sorry, I did not understand the last part of your question. What were you saying? Is a five stage uh, pipeline? Uh, uh, Miss, my my question was that, uh, sir. Uh, every time there's a bash instruction, we may be losing cycles. Uh, not only in, not only when there is loop, not, not only when there is loop, right? I mean, I'm losing your voice. Uh, sir, uh, now uh, am I? Can you speak up loudly? Yes, go ahead. Sir, am I audible now? Now you're audible. Yes. Uh, sir, my question was that every time there is a branch instruction, we may, we may be losing cycles, not only in the case of loops, right, sir? Not only in the? Case of loops. 
No, I mean, see, this problem only comes when there is a branch instruction. If there is no branch instruction, then, you know, after five, you are supposed to execute six and then seven and eight and nine. Problem only came because there was branch. Because otherwise, you know, if there is no branch, then, you know, after five, you execute six, then seven, then eight, then nine. And, you know, your problem is solved. Uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. It means only when there is a branch instruction, then only this hazard means then only this type of uh, uh, wasting of cycles may occur. Right? Correct. Uh, yes, sir. You know what? Remember, I told you a sentence that you know you can't have too many registers in a uh, RISC processor. When I say you can't have too many, it's more the merrier. If you give me thousand registers. I would be very happy. See what people do if you want to avoid this kind of penalty. One thing is open up the loop. If your loop is say just a small loop, say five times, you can open up the loop five times. You know, of course, you have to upgrade it, and you know you have to make uh, the uh, possibility of you know it is your responsibility to see that your counters are upgraded. If you can open up the loop five times, then you know your program may become very long. But then you know there is no loop. You are just going one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Then you know your performance will be very good. Uh, and you know you are not losing any cycle. And you know when you open it up, you require more registers because you know now there are different values that you will have to store. So that is also one reason why you would like to have more and more registers. There are many reasons why you should not have more registers because you know reading them, finding them. It's also a problem, and also uh, when you're working now at a two megahertz, I mean two gigahertz or three gigahertz speed, uh, processor, I mean registers are supposed to be extremely quick, and plus it also becomes expensive to have too many registers. But uh, an argument for having more registers is this: that you know you open up the loop, and then you know of course you have to write the program appropriately because otherwise you know. If you don't take uh, effort of updating the loop, then you know your program, you know, might be overwriting a particular, uh, you know, memory location. You have to upgrade the memory location in the opened up loop. You can try it out in your own. You write one C program, you know, maybe having five loops, and then you say, okay, now I want to make this loop disappear. I would like to write this set of uh, uh, C instructions five times. What precautions you have to take that you know your answer is still the same, but you are not you are not forcing your compiler to take any branch. So you know I mean if you do that you know it, that problem would become immediately clear to you that what will you have to do to reach uh, phrase your program in opening up the loop. So if you open up the loop, this problem will go away. But you know, opening up the loop is one problem. If it is uh, your compiler does open up the loop, right? You know, I mean, most of the time, you know, if possible, it opens up the loop provided you have enough number of registers. But you know, it can't open it up beyond certain number of times. So then, you know, there's again this problem will come and stare you. So, Any other problem? It, yes. Uh, yes, Mandan. Is it Kandar? Uh, yes, yes, sir. Sir, here, uh, ca uh, can we write the one and two instruction of a, after the fifth instruction? Because okay, if so as I told if, you, you have to check all kinds of hazard before shifting it. Because right now I don't know what is instruction number one so or not two. Not shifting it. We will also keep the one and two there, but we'll again write the one and two after the fifth uh, instruction. So yeah. if the if if the loop does not terminate, then one and two can continue. But so if you say it one and two terminate at the top and also at the bottom. So I mean keep yeah. one, two, three, four, five, one, two, right? Y yes, sir. But you know that would create a problem when you get out of the loop. Yes, sir. But so like at that time, time we would have to lose two instructions to flush the one and two and then continue with six and seven. But if in in that condition, if even if we run the loop one thousand times, then two thousand cycles would not be wasted. No, so see, if you are writing one two in the loop and outside the loop also, 
then you know you are executing instruction number one and two twice. Right? Because you are leaving one and two over here. And then you know you're also writing one and two over here. You know, think about it. You are saying that you know uh, yeah, yes, one and two executed again, and then it is again going back to one and two. Right? If that's my correct understanding of your question. So you can't leave if you want to write one and two outside. Then you can't have it over here. Yes, yes, sir. Yeah. Yes, sir. Here uh, we have shifted uh, instruction two and three uh, after branch instruction five. Uh, yes. But sir, what if uh, instruction two and three and instruction four are data dependent? Yes, Means result of two and three. You can't will do be it. Four. Yes. So I mean that is exactly the problem, and I, that's why I told you that you can't do it every time. I'm, and I told you this is only the best case scenario. Uh, most of the time, you know, there are lots of dependencies and, you know, dependencies you have to take care of. Otherwise, they will turn into hazard if you shift things around. So, yes, that problem is always there. And, you know, if your compiler is able to do that, you know, then it's very lucky. See, otherwise, uh, the next alternative is to lose uh, two cycles every time. And which, uh, as a processor designer, you shouldn't like because you know you are degrading your performance. Your games will become slower. And sir, okay. this uh, and sir, this uh, shifting of two instruction is a solution for loop type of branch instruction. But what if branch instruction is uh, uh, means? Is pointed to means five fifth is a branch instruction and it point as instruction eight or seven. So then so the that solution is like a is not type good. of instruction. So you know that is done only once. Right? You know, usually uh, uh, you will see that uh, even in writing programs that go to or jump forward type of instructions are not chosen. Because, you know, if you allow that, then, you know, programs would like, you know, jump around everywhere and then, you know, it will mess up your cache or, or your memory access thing. You know, you will realize it more when we study memory architecture. That, you know, so loops are okay. I mean, you have to have loops, but, you know, jumping forward is only done in the case of uh, extreme uh, uh, requirement. So you would have been told, like, you know, at least I, when I was a student, you know, there was a go to statement in uh, basic language. And you know, you are not supposed to use that because you know, it is going to mess things up at that time. We didn't know why we are not supposed to use go to statement. But then, you know, I mean, this is the reason after studying the architecture and memory, you realize that, you know, you should write your programs in certain way, which does not affect the performance. Sir? Yes. Sir, you said that, uh... Opening up the loop requires more registers. Yes. But, but uh, we don't require more registers for opening up the loop. Like we are anyways going to override the register. Okay. Uh, is there a loop? I think uh, we'll uh, look into it uh, slightly later when we are done with the memory and other uh, portions. Uh, you will uh, realize that, you know, I mean, that also uh, brings us into more into compiler territory that, you know, how it can be open and why the results are done. In fact, I will show you one example of by opening up the loops that, you know, why do you require more number of registers? You know, probably at that time it would be clear to you. Like it, it looks like that because, you know, it looks yes, like that loop. Uh, because uh, copy pasting the all the instructions of the loop uh, doesn't make the program program wrong. Okay, copy pasting the suppose if I have one two three four five, just imagine you have written a program. Uh, one two three four five. If you just copy paste one two three four five one two three four five one two three four five five times just as is, then you can be rest you can rest assured that you know if you are trying to create an array, it will not create an array. It will just you know overwrite. Same memory location. Do you agree with me? 
see in a loop, you know, fourth instruction might be that, you know, okay, you increment it by one. And, you know, but sometimes, you know, if you don't go by that particular thing, then, you know, you might be overwriting things. In fact, there is something which is considered as software pipelining. And, you know, you open up the loop and, you know, there is a, uh, let me not go into it because, you know, this will make things more complicated. So at the moment, you know, just this much is sufficient and uh, just satisfy yourself with the case that, you know, in this kind of a thing, you know, you are losing two cycles. There is a possibility that, you know, you can avoid it. I mean, it may or may not be available, but, you know, there is a possibility that, you know, you can do something like this. You are breaking the law of computer science. You are inviting control hazard. But you know you have done all the checks and you have made sure that control hazard does not occur. Okay. 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 Fine. So let us uh, talk about some points. Uh, first is like you know you are going to have two exams coming. Uh, first of all, all your quizzes are graded. I mean, it grading is automatic in Moodle. Uh, the question which you should ask is, would it be considered in the towards the final grade? So the exam which would be taken on uh, Thursday would be considered towards your final grade. Uh, what the quiz which you have been taken, you know, it will be in a very similar uh, way, but time given to you would be short. Because, you know, the first time, you know, 25 questions in one hour, then, you know, similar time was given to you next time. That was just to prepare you to, you know, work slowly. But, you know, now it will be like, you know, you will be given 30 seconds to a minute for a question. It may not be that every question requires 30 seconds or a minute. There are some questions may require two minutes or so, and then some questions, you know, you should just be able to take a look at it and give the answer. But, you know, this time there will be more question in less time. So you should be ready for that. In the midterm, you will be allowed to look at uh, your uh, copy of uh, your quick reference guide. Don't try to open the book or something because, you know, we try to put in more question and less time. So you won't have time to help out your brothers and sisters or, you know, try to look for answers in the net or, you know, try to use uh, the uh, Kyle compiler to get the answer. If you try to do that, then, you know, you will be missing out on a lot of answering other questions. So that is the thing, you know, which for the Thursday's quiz and then, you know, uh, 28th midterm. 28th midterm would be on metal platform. And uh, this one would be on uh, uh, Thursday quiz will be on your normal Moodle platform. Those guys, you know, who are not able to uh, join Moodle, I've given you like, you know, two warnings that, you know, if you are not able to do it, you need to talk to uh, system administrator, uh, because there must be some reason why you are not uh, allowed in. Uh, probably there might be a problem with your registration or something. So that is uh, regarding the exam. We will not be taking uh, a Wednesday's lecture. Uh, I would, for the course, I would be asking only up to uh, ARM architecture. I will not be asking any question regarding uh, this implementation detail, unless, you know, it is very, very simple and, you know, something, you know, which is also taught as a part of ARM architecture. So no complicated problems, if at all, will be asked from uh, the second part that is implementation. But, you know, simple problems can be asked, you know, which is also uh, can legitimately be called a part of ARM architecture. Does anyone have any question up to that point? Sir, will there be lab also on Thursday? Uh, no, there will not be any lab. There will be 40 minutes or 50 minutes for a quiz. And then, you know, there will be a question and answer session. You know, you can solve your difficulties. You should be, I mean, I would inform the uh, uh, process, I mean, inform the TAs. But today also you can ask your questions, you know, during the lab hours uh, on this Monday session. And you can also do the same post exam uh, in the Thursday session. We will not have a lecture on 
Wednesday. Paper pattern would be very similar to what you have been giving. So there will be multiple choice or write a short answer type of thing. And you know, please follow the instructions very carefully. If they have asked you to write a uh, answer in a particular way, then you know you write that thing in a particular way. Um, suppose if you are asked that you know write uh, uh, all the instructions and all the registers in capital, then you know follow that. You may say that you know writing it in in uh, lower case is also allowed. Well, it may be so, but you know I mean this all the correction is going to be done automatically, and you know no one has time to go back and check. So not following the instruction is also a wrong thing. So not following the given instruction if you don't follow it, uh, then you know it will uh, cause you a problem. Will there be a negative marking? You know, yes, possibly I'm going to keep it. If there's a negative marking, it will be clearly told to you uh, before uh, starting the program. Uh, during uh, the midterm, uh, when the exam is taken on metal platform, then the first question, in place of first question, the arm quick reference uh, three pages would be there. So you can jump back and forth between referring to the arm quick reference and other things. At that time, you will not be allowed to keep a paper with you uh, when the exam is on the metal platform. Sir, on Moodle, which will there be allowed uh, test? Will there be allowed to go back because many times uh, we get a strike after sometimes? So. No. Uh, in metal exam, when it is on metal, you'll be allowed to go back and forth. In Moodle, I mean, it depends. I mean, uh, Moodle, uh, you can, uh, but you know, whatever is the thing, you know, you will be clearly told what you can do and you can't do. In metal, you will definitely be allowed back and forth, at least reach up to question one all the time, because question one contains your quick reference guide. Now, what are the new branches we are opening? Uh, this one question, you know, I wanted to do, so I've I got a short uh, thing. Hello, sir. Uh, yes. Before that, can you go to 24 slides? I want to take the screen for it. 24. Is that the one which you want? I done, sir. Yes. Done, sir. What do you want me to do? No, sir. I think, sir. I just wanted to take this screenshot. Okay. Ah, uh, the new branch which I'm going to talk to you about is this. And you know, in fact, I'll be talking about this more uh, after your midterm. But you know, let me give you a very quick and brief idea that you know we are going to open up a new uh, branch called BTEC in ICT with minor in VLSI and embedded system. So the purpose of this uh, program is like this. We have seen that you know if you right now people who pass out with the BTEC in ICT, they are missing out three or four important courses which are required by the VLSI industry. So what happens is that the current BTEC in ICT has only one option to go to software industry, right? I mean, they have, they can't go to Qualcomm uh, in uh, the semiconductor side or go to uh, Cadence or Synopsys or Samsung for that purpose. So what we are trying to do is when we introduce this new branch, uh, which is BTEC in ICT, I mean, the degree will remain the same, ICT, but you know, with a minor in VLSI and embedded system. So we are going to introduce three or four courses in third and fourth year, you know, spaced out. If you take those courses, you will be also eligible to sit in uh, interviews which are conducted by semiconductor industry. So that means you are not taking away your chances of getting into software industry, but by taking this VLSI and uh, embedded system uh, three and four additional courses, you are also opening up the other avenue of employment. So, in fact, you are increasing your chances of getting employed. And for that reason, you know, I have invited some people who are from MTech and BTech 
they will talk to you because you know right now they are all sitting pretty. One of uh, uh, my student, uh, Ayushi Sharma, she graduated in 2017. She is now working in Google as one of the top uh, VLSI engineers in Bangalore. So there are plenty of job opportunities, and you know the VLSI industry is not coming till now to DI city since 2017 onwards. I mean it's very simple. Till 2015, 16, there were enough BTEC students, you know, who were taking this course because, but because of the restructuring of the courses, some of the important VLSI courses were taken out, and that left the BTEC students ineligible to sit in the VLSI uh, interviews or semiconductor in, uh, industry interview. So now we would like to change it by taking these courses, you know, we will have like, you know, if we have enough 25, 30, 40 students or more from BTEC and ICT would like to opt for minor in VLSI and embedded system, then, you know, we can offer a larger pattern, U plus MTech in VLSI. So that will make good 40, 50 students. And then VLSI industry would start coming here. I remember uh, in 2017, when the interviews were there, Qualcomm came here and said, we would like to hire 25 students from your BTEC. But you know what? Not a single student was eligible because they did not take those courses. So this is something, you know, I'm telling you, I may circulate a Google form and, you know, which may ask you that, you know, your initial interest. It is not a binding thing, but, you know, we would like to know how many of you would be interested to consider this minor in VLSI and embedded system. Once again, you are not losing any of your courses which would get you a job in say Google, Amazon, and whatever other uh, your dream companies are. But uh, in uh, by taking this minor, you are opening up another avenue, right? So I mean that I will circulate a Google form. And the last question is which chapter you need to cover from ARM assembly language book? I mean you know I mean all the six, eight, nine, whatever you are there, right up to. Uh, that you know subroutine kind of thing you know you need to read up up to that point remember that you will not be asked to write a long program because you know there is a so you will not be asked to write programs like you do for your homework assignment you know probably for that for lab they may think of holding a separate quiz but at least for the here you will be asked short questions like what you have been answering till now there will be some tough questions which will be of debugging then you know you need to uh, have an eye for figuring out the problem in a given code. Okay, any other question? Okay, so we stop at this point and we'll meet after the midterm. Uh, I wish you all a very best for your midterm and you know your quiz. Sir, I have one question. Yes. Sir, for those students who have selected already minor in computational science branch, they have already one subject extra after the third sem. So would they be allowed to take this course? Okay, so at the moment, BTEC ICT students uh, are the one of the easiest thing to do. If you already chosen one minor, how to choose another minor? I'm not sure right now. I mean, there might be a possibility. There might be a possibility of overload. I'm not sure about that. But you know, people who are in BTEC ICT have, or, or BTEC in CS, they have this wonderful opportunity to take few extra courses. So BTEC ICT, BTEC CS are the one you know who are sure to find a job in. I mean, sure to find a job in a semiconductor industry because you know. CS people should not be surprised that you know what they do in semiconductor industry. It is most of the time it is programming. That you will nobody will ask you to solve a problems of a circuit or something. Those things are done automatically by software programs. So we'll talk more about it later. Okay, so thank you very much and wish you all the best.